Good morning, I'm Captain Arthur, and during this period of instruction, we're going to be discussing some of the principles that are involved in survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. And I know we all hope that we will never be found in these types of situations, but more so what we're going to do is look at the code of conduct. The code of conduct is something that is a, by order of the president, that was published in 1955 after the Korean conflict came to an end. And you might ask yourself why, after almost 200 years of having a military service, do all of a sudden we need something in writing that shows what an American serviceman's responsibilities are. Well, a couple of things came up during the Korean conflict that showed that the American soldier, for the most part, was unfamiliar with his responsibilities in a wartime situation. Three of the things that came about were we had approximately 1,600,000 men committed to the Korean conflict, and that's a lot of people. 7,200 of those became prisoners of war, one out of every 220. It came out that after the Korean conflict was over and these men returned to the United States, that 565 investigations were started into the actions of some of these men that they had committed something wrong against their comrades or against the United States. Only 14 of these 565 actually went to court-martial, and of those, 11 were convicted. So it's a small percentage, isn't it, 11 out of 565? But you add on to that 21 people who decided to stay with the North Koreans and not be repatriated because they had been thoroughly brainwashed, and this is a, a communist term, this brainwashing, the psychological indoctrination that had taken place was so successful that we had 21 people decide not to be repatriated. So we had 32 people who, according to the standards of what is expected of an American serviceman, did not measure up. You couple with that also the fact that in the Korean conflict, we had the first time when there were no successful POW escape attempts. There were a few before people were incarcerated, but the Hogan's Heroes concept, if you, and I'm sure you've all seen that, of a prisoner of war camp is at an end. It's not the World War II type situation anymore. In North Korea, the psychological indoctrination that took place was very effective for a number of reasons, and unfortunately, we don't have time today to go into that. And thirdly, something happened in North Korea that had not happened uh, to American POWs before. And that was that there was a large number of persons, 40% as a matter of fact, who did not make it back alive to the United States. Almost 40% of our POWs died in the POW camps. And it wasn't because of malnutrition, even though we realize that in a POW camp, um, the food is not all that great. It was not because of injuries or illnesses, even though that played a small part. For the most part, the men did not make it back because they had simply lost the will to survive. They gave up because of situations. They gave up hope in themselves, in their comrades, and in their country. They refused to eat. They refused to leave their bunk, and they eventually died of starvation. They had forgotten the three basic things that they had been taught throughout their military career both external and internal self-discipline, following the leadership that was appointed over them, and also taking the leadership, and lastly, organizing themselves into a unit so they could help one another. These three things were not followed. And consequently, 40% of the people who went into the POW camps did not come out, mainly because of their loss of will to survive. So this bothered President Eisenhower at that time enough that he said, we need a written code of conduct so that the American soldier, sailor, airman, whatever, can look at this and know what is expected of him. And so this morning, that is what the main thrust of our discussion will be. Now, the code of conduct is only 247 words, so it says a lot in just six short articles. Now, on your handouts that you have, the six articles are written out there and space for notes, we're going to discuss just briefly the articles and some of the evasion techniques that you can use. Now,
please don't think that uh, in the few minutes we've got that we're going to make uh, an expert out of you in evasion techniques and things like that because there are schools that involve many weeks of training uh, that do this type of thing. Our interest is more in the code of conduct itself. And you'll notice on there one of the objectives, number four, has to do with exceptions to the code of conduct that we in the Army Medical Department uh, have that makes our responsibilities just a little bit different in a given situation. Articles 1 and 6 are general articles that apply during both peacetime and wartime, so we'll look at those just briefly. Article number 1 states that I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. How does this strike you as a physician or a dentist? I don't know if we have any uh, veterinary officers in here or not. How does this strike you, this article? I am an American fighting man. Do you consider yourself an American fighting man? Okay, yes, sir. Why is that? Because I am helping the, the soldiers to recuperate the wounds. Okay, very good. We, this is a team effort, is it not? Yes, sir. We're part of a team, and if we try to remove ourselves from the responsibility that the total armed forces has of being a fighting team, you know, this is not good, is it? So we are part of this team. Did you ever notice I, I ask this question a lot to classes? How many of you, when you raise your hands for the first time, ever seriously give thought to the fact that you might be called upon to give your life in defense of your country? And I usually get about 10%. You know, usually this is the type of thing, you know, it is a job to do, and we come in and we do our job for X number of years, however long we have, but many times we don't even consider this until we get put in a situation where it might become a reality. This is something to think about. And then Article 6 is more or less a reiteration of the first article. I will never forget that I am an American fighting man responsible for my actions and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. Both the first and the last articles. And then I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Many, there are many things as you read books uh, by both North Vietnamese uh, POWs and Korean POWs that bring up the fact that there are some things that really keep a person going in a POW situation. And if any of you have read uh, Commander Booker's book and also what I'm reading now uh, by a lieutenant colonel who was a Vietnamese POW for seven and a half years, the strong religious faith that they have had uh, during their lifetime is something that really kept them going during that period. Any questions or comments on Articles 1 and 6 before we move on? Uh, yes, sir. Captain, are there any atheists in foxholes? You know saying is, you know, are there any atheists in foxholes? It, from my understanding, you know, uh, people will do a lot of things when they're in an endangered life situation. But it's been found, and psychological studies were done of returning POWs from Korea that found that those people that uh, made it through with the least psychological damage were those not who had supposedly had a foxhole religious type experience, but those who um, had internalized within them that these religious concepts and beliefs for many, many years, and uh, their religious faith kept them going. But well, then, if you were in a situation where, uh, say, you were captured and mm -hmm. you were placed in charge of this squad, of your rank, uh, what would be the best way to counsel uh, one of your squad members who uh, had no resistance? Well, I think that would have to be a personal type thing. Uh, myself, I have had a lot of religious background and training, uh, so I would handle that in a certain way. It might be different from somebody else. But uh, as far as personal experience goes and the readings that I have done by people who have been placed in the situation, and who have testified to the fact that it is something that they have had beliefs for many years and this was the thing that kept them going. Uh, their belief in 
their God that uh, really made the difference. That without that hope, uh, that um, it could have been entirely a different situation. So, but like I said, I'd, people would handle it differently probably. Any other questions or comments? Okay, as we move along to Article 2, now, we're going to be looking at Articles 2, 3, 4, and 5, and each one has an exception that applies to Army Medical Department personnel that is going to be very important. Article 2 states that I will never surrender of my own free will. And if I command, I will never surrender my men while they still have the means to resist. Now, of course, this means to resist is always a subjective type thing, isn't it? And so that person who has responsibility for command will have to make that. But put yourself in a situation. You are in charge of a field medical facility. And that tactical commander says, I have to pull out because of the situation. And you've got non-transportable patients in your facility. They can't be moved. What are you going to have to do with them? You just take off and leave them? Okay. I don't think they, if they're non-transportable, obviously they really don't have the means to resist on their own. Okay. And uh, as such, you're responsible for their safety and welfare. Okay, good. So what are you going to do then if you have non-transportable patients who cannot take care of themselves? Maintain your position and continue to treat them. Okay, very good. Anytime that tactical commander says, we have to move from this area, and you've got patients there that can't be moved, you're going to have to leave some qualified medical person there to take care of him, however many number of people you have. So you are in effect, if you are a medic, you are in effect uh, surrendering yourself. And in a, in a different article here, we'll get into the fact of why you can do this and not really be considered a POW. And of course, that medical commander there, if you've got a clearing company or a battalion aid station or something, that doctor has the responsibility of leaving somebody behind. And it's the old volunteer or get volunteered type thing. He has to leave a qualified person. It might be a 91 Bravo who is just out of the school here. It might be a 91 Charlie. But whoever can take care of him has to be left behind. So that is the exception there. You have to leave a qualified medical person with any non-transportable patients. Any questions on that point? And as I mentioned, we will get to one in just a minute where uh, we can do this and not be considered POWs. Okay, now we have, of course, let's leave ourselves some alternatives, right? You know, if you don't want to surrender, what do you do? Okay, just consider we do not have any patients. We have moved our patients and we don't want to surrender, we still have the means to resist, and you're in charge of a medical facility here in the field, what are you going to do? Okay. One of the things we can do is defend in place. Now, granted for the most part, we do not have that many organic weapons, do we? Uh, 45 caliber pistols and M16s, uh, rifles, to effect a defense in place. But normally, if the tactical commander is smart, he will have located your facility in some kind of a location where at least he can either defend it easily or get replacements to you. If he is not and you cannot stay there and effectively defend your treatment facility, the next thing you would have to do is to effect a breakout. Now, here we get into offensive operations, don't we? These are things that get totally away from the AMED concept of things and get into offensive operations. And that is mustering your forces to move from that location to some place that is not in enemy contact. And once you do this, you will lose certain protections under the Geneva Conventions of 1949 that we'll discuss in just a minute. Number three is something that we in the AMED don't think too much about, and that is deeper penetration to conduct guerrilla activities. Now, it's always a temptation to think, you know, that we could do something like this, but unless somebody is especially trained uh, in ranger tactics, something like this, this is just best left well enough alone, so 
We'll pass over that without too much comment. This is not something that we're trained for. Fourthly, to separate and infiltrate. Now we do this for a couple of reasons. A larger force is obviously easier to be detected, right? So break down into smaller groups of three to five individuals that really minimizes your chances of being detected, but at the same time gives you a large enough group to, group to be able to defend yourself if you absolutely have to. And we do have an evasion type course here that we use with other classes, and possibly some of you have been uh, through something like this, I'm not sure. They are a very good teaching tool. And lastly, I think obviously, is any combination of the above actions can be used if you have to, not necessarily in, the, in those particular orders, any combination of those. Do I have any questions on those uh, five points here? Okay, if we are, if we find ourselves in an evasion situation, I said at the beginning, obviously we don't have the time or anything here to make experts out of y'all in things involving uh, survival, evasion, and escape. It's not possible, but there are some very obvious points that we will look at, principles of evasion, obvious points that we'll look at that will show us if we, we're in a situation like this, uh, how to survive. Number one is travel at night. Or you can expand that if you say travel during times of limited visibility. Obviously, unless the enemy has uh, equipment that aids their night vision, like we do with the starlight scopes and various aids, um, your chances of being detected by traveling at night uh, will be much greater. Secondly, a selection of concealment. Now, the infantry soldier, the combat arms are trained in this. They go through extensive training in camouflage techniques, in concealment, things like this. And what it boils down to for right now is that we don't obviously travel across open fields during broad daylight type thing. Usually, wherever you are, there will be enough concealment that if used wisely, your detection chances will be lessened a great deal. So, selection of concealment. Avoid urban areas. Avoid urban areas. There are a couple of reasons for this. Can anybody tell me what one reason might be why we would avoid urban areas? Populous might be unfriendly. Okay, good point. Populous might be unfriendly. And chances are, if you were behind enemy lines, uh, the populace would be very unfriendly, wouldn't they? Good point. Anything else? And therefore, following right on that, if they were unfriendly uh, and you were walking around, your chances of detection would probably be quite a bit greater, right? Now, even though we, um, for the most part, here are Anglo-Saxon, uh, if we were in Southeast Asia, we just wouldn't fit in, would we? You know. You might look like a populace uh, in, a, in Europe, for example. We might fit in as far as looks of the people, but language fluency would come in, mannerisms would come in, things like this that could really hamper our escape efforts. We just wouldn't fit in, regardless of how much we look like or thought we acted like the population. There's another reason, and perhaps some of you have seen something like this or similar to it. Does anybody know what this is? It's part, right, it's exactly right. It's part of an escape kit. It's called a blood chit. Blood chit, C-H-I-T. And this is issued to personnel who are more likely to come into enemy contact. And what this does, it's got the American flag at the top, as you can see, and it explains that you are an American fighting man in need of help. And it offers a reward to anyone in the indigenous population there who will help you. All they have to do is turn it in to the authorities and they will get a reward. This comes with uh, gold bullion for trading. It was issued in Vietnam and 
uh, with barter things like watches, gold bullion, etc. And this is from Southeast Asia. It's got about 20 languages on there, uh, indigenous to that area. And it is a serial number item, so it is accountable. And you would give this then to anyone who would help you. Now, why do we say avoid urban areas? Well, chances are, if anybody is going to help you, it would be in the rural areas where they cannot be detected either. Because the people who are going to help you are going to be few and far between, aren't they? There might be some kind of underground movement uh, that will. But uh, you would more likely find these people in the rural areas where they will not be detected as well. So those are the, the two or three reasons, therefore, avoiding urban areas. Next, and we'll look at these two simultaneously, conserve food and conserve strength. Now, obviously, again, if you're traveling in an evasion situation, if you are going to go against some of the other principles, like travel at night and selecting concealment, if you had to go long distances over open areas, you would not choose to do that even though it was the shortest uh, means of getting back to friendly territory. So you would probably spend several days in this type of situation. And if you did, you would have to conserve your food because you might not have that much to go along with. You don't eat everything at once. You don't drink everything at once because you get into three days. We had several, uh, many soldiers in Korea and Vietnam who did just that. They consumed all of their food at one time and then three days later, they were so malnutritioned and had not conserved their strength because of it that they were captured. They could not go on any farther. Conserve food and conserve strength. And lastly, and possibly one of the most important, has to do with not stealing any critical items. Don't steal any critical items. Okay. For example, that's a good point. What do we mean by a critical item? Vehicle, good point. Vehicles. Announces your presence. And what you bring up is very important because in an evasion situation, what is one thing you don't want to give the enemy? You let them know you're there, right? Obviously. You want to stay as far away from people as you possibly can. And so you start stealing things like vehicles, uh, communication equipment, you know, we in the military, we have to sign for a lot of stuff, don't we? And you can believe if you're going to steal something from, you know, some private or equivalent, and he's responsible for it, you know he's going to uh, start raising a fuss about it. So vehicles, communications equipment, how about weapons? Suppose you find yourself in a situation where you don't have any weapons, and you have the, you have a chance to get one. What you do about that? I see a shaking head up here going this way. Okay. Posing view. You say no. Why would you not want to steal a weapon? Wouldn't that help you? Uh, it, would, it might give you a limited amount of uh, defensibility, but the amount of defensibility is opposed to your the fact that, you know, a uh, native isn't going to steal a weapon probably. It's going to uh, be an indication of some hostile uh, reaction or action mm -hmm. involved. Sh sh you're going to bring all sorts of fire and brimstone down on your head. Okay, you made a comment. Yeah, as soon as you shoot it, they're going to know you're there. Sure. The first thing, you get a gun, and what's, what's your motivation to do? Shoot. To use it. All right. And so, even in the Ranger School at Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, in the Air Force, SEER, Survival Evasion Resistance and Escape Classes, that the Air Force has, the Navy has, the prime thing is, unless it is absolutely necessary, try not to steal a weapon because you will be motivated to use it and give your position away and get closer to people because you feel you can defend yourself. And it might sound kind of funny at first, but what uh, Captain Engel Scott mentioned up here is very important, that it gives your position away, you will use it, and you want to stay as far away from people as possible. Any further questions or comments on, on these six uh, principles of evasion here?